my face is on there. Or... <laughs> Check your email. Dave. See me? <laughs> yep. How'd you do, Gabrielle? Impersonation, Dave. How <laughs> <laughs> about that? Okay. Let's see. It's on a little lag, so. So, we'll hear all the new ones. Yeah. You just said Sorry, they're broadcasting me for some reason. Are you? Oh, there she is. There okay. She is. All right, I think we're good. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. It's amazing. Actually, I'll ask you, uh, how's my volume? Oh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. I think I need to be mute on your side. Then will you still be close, but not? I actually can hear myself as an echo. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I can ignore it. I just turned my volume way down. Okay. I still want to be able to hear you. So is the volume good for the people that are listening? Yeah, it sounds good on our end. Okay, so I can just keep it pretty conversational. Like I'm not pretending I'm in a very large hall <laughs> or something. No, no, it should be fine. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started if that's okay. Okay. Oh, I just reached out the YouTube link, so thank you for your patience and for all of our viewers' patience. A little technical yes. news. So uh, we want to welcome Ms. Gabrielle Zevin, author of The Storied Life of A.J. Fickery, our community retitle. She's broadcasting live with us today from California. From California. Sweet. It's land of sun. Well, I'm in the past because it's still sunny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's dark. Right and now. you're in the future. Yeah. <laughs> so we just want to talk with you today about your book, um, some of the creative process, um, your thoughts about it, how you were motivated by it. And then we have a few questions from a couple of book clubs for you. Okay. So I'll just talk and um, hope it gets out there. And if you want to stop me at any time, you should feel free to. Uh, mm -hmm. And... <laughs> Actually, the funny thing is right now I'm staring at a dead fly on my desk because yesterday I did the amazing thing of killing a dead fly on my own head, Whoa. which which is amazing. You just don't expect that it's going to happen. And so then I haven't taken care of like <laughs> the insect disposal yet. So, so just know that that's what's happening from my end. We're just we're setting a scene here. Um, but yes, the storied life of A.J. Fickery, which is free of dead flies of any kind. <laughs> and has some dead people, <laughs> spoiler alert. Uh, I will talk about that now. Um, a couple of months ago when I was in the height of doing a lot of book touring, I was having a conversation with a bookseller in Atlanta and he asked me if I knew what the first writing was. And I felt like on some level deep in my subconscious I did, but at that time I didn't remember. And he reminded me that the first writing ever was accounting bookkeeping. That's what they were writing on the cave walls, you know, like you needed to know, you know, if you owed somebody 
like three trees and they had taken one goat from you. That's why they decided to put, you know, pen to paper and write it on, on the wall. And so I was thinking how really the first writing was about what I owe you and more importantly, what you owe me. And in a way, all fiction is kind of like this too. It's a kind of emotional accounting. Um, most books, including AJ Fickery are balance sheets. Man loses one thing, man gets something else, man lives to lose again. And so I think that's kind of what Fickery is. He loses this thing that is his very valuable and uh, priceless manuscript, Tamerlane. And uh, in return, he gets a toddler. And sometimes people will laugh when I say that and kind of say, well, I'd rather have the book <laughs> than the baby. But in fact, but yes, so the storied life of A.J. Fickery is about, is about kind of a guy who is, you know, an accountant of sorts as a bookseller, you know, and, and he has a very monetary relationship to, uh, to books in a way that you only have that relationship if you maybe work in a library or you are an author and you sort of have this sense of what the cost of bookstore, you know, so the story of life of AJ Fickery is about a bookseller who discovers a toddler in his bookstore. And it's also about though, the difference books can make in the life of a child or really a person of any age at all. Mm -hmm. So, um, I sold my first novel in February of 2004, 11 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and my second novel in July of that same year. And I will say I rarely felt as pleased with myself as I did in July of 2004. And that's because there's no time so sweet in a young writer's career as the time between when you have your first book deal and that book actually has to come out into the world. I had ideas about what I thought publishing was going to look like. And most of those ideas, I'm not embarrassed to admit, came from movies I had seen or books I'd read that kind of tangentially had publishing in them. So I kind of think of like Wonder Boys by Michael Chabon or like the whole like John Irving canon or Little Women. And particularly in Little Women when <laughs> Joe gets her publishing deal. And in the movie version I'm talking, uh, uh, this older German man who is her friend and almost her lover shows up and the book is wrapped entirely in brown paper and that seems to be how publishing works. So I kind of thought at some point an older German man, maybe he'd be my lover, but he could just be like a friend, would show up and the book would be wrapped in brown paper and cut to New York Times bestseller list and cut to me walking down like Fifth Avenue, my pictures on the side of a bus like Carrie Bradshaw style. And I kind of thought I was on the verge of the sort of literary fame that included like feuds and, you know, readings at the 92nd Street Y and maybe I'd end up like a drunk but I'd be like a nice drunk and it would just affect my work in a positive way but you know and I kind of thought publishing was going to to look like that and I've noticed that most writers have very sad first novel stories and myself included my publisher uh closed in the middle of my first novel coming out which is usually not a good sign for what's going to happen with that book but my publisher closed um, but i have noticed that almost every novelist has a very sad first novel story and i think it's not so much that every publisher closes or does a terrible job publishing these books it's because the gap between what you uh think publishing is going to look like and what it actually is like is very vast um, but if I go back in time, before I was published, everything to do with bookstores and books and libraries for me was a total joy. I have never worked in a bookstore or a library, but on some level, like the Maya character, I basically grew up in them. And I can see my life in a series of bookstores. I can think of the Grolier Poetry Shop in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is still there. And I personally like living in a world where we have 900 square feet spaces devoted entirely to poetry, you know, and I can think of Murder, Inc., which used to be on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, but which is no longer there. And, you know, when you went to Murder, Inc., like a big black Hound of the Baskervilles style dog would greet you when you came through the door. And, you know, I like being hand sold books that way, or kind of, I guess, paw sold books, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and But if I go back in time to my earliest bookstore memories, I can kind of think of my parents uh, letting me, my parents worked at uh, IBM, but on the weekends they would let me like go alone to the bookstore that was next to the grocery store. And it was the first place that I was ever allowed to go by myself. And, you know, I still associate uh, going to a bookstore with this sort of like 
heady sense of freedom. And I think it's kind of funny because probably reading A.J. Figury, you would guess this, but my parents must have thought that nothing bad could ever happen to a child left unattended in a bookstore. Um, and nothing bad ever did happen, but I, I always feel like I should add the disclaimer, you shouldn't leave your child just in a bookstore or a library for someone else to, to watch, though I know some people do. Uh, most of my books have started out with a question, but for the storied life of A.J. Fickrey, I had two questions. And the first was, why do bookstores and libraries, for that matter, matter? And how do the stories we read define our lives? It's been a little over 10 years since I sold my first novel. And these years have been, as you all know, a time of enormous change for the book industry. We've seen the rise of the e-reader, the way social media and just this kind of thing has completely changed the author-reader relationship the question of whether to order online or shop locally. And I wanted to write a book that talked a bit about all of those things. But for me, uh, the storied life of AJ Fickery is really about the difference books can make in a person's life. It's about AJ's daughter, Maya, and the way her life is changed for the better because it has books in it and because her mother chose to leave her in a bookstore as opposed to any other place. Um, so I could read very briefly, I often do here. And it's just, I. I always read briefly, don't worry, this won't go on a very long time, because something I've learned over the years from giving readings is that people who go to readings tend to know how to read, so I think I'm safe keeping it short. Maya knows that her mother left her in island books, but maybe that's what happens to all children of a certain age. Some children are left in shoe stores, and some children are left in toy stores, and some children are left in sandwich shops, and your whole life is determined by what store you get left in. She does not want to live in the sandwich shop. And, you know, in a way, I definitely think this is true. I have written books for young adults, and I've had the opportunity to, like, speak in schools over the years. And now I'm going to make a terrible generalization about something I've observed from speaking in schools, which is that children who read grow into adults that you want to know. And it turns out there's kind of scientific reasons that this is true. Um, the sooner you kind of scientific or at least... Uh, you know, sort of psychiatric reasons. But the sooner you kind of put a book into a child's hands, the sooner they discover that there are people in the world other than themselves and places in the world other than the ones they currently find themselves in. Um, you, I think child psychologists refer to this as theory of mind. You and I think of this as empathy, but it turns out that empathy is a really great quality in a person that you want to share your town space or your world with. Um, and it's funny because people often ask me, how do we make readers? And, you know, I don't actually think it is terribly difficult, but I can tell you how my, I can tell you how my parents made me uh, into a reader, which is that every weekend we would go to the library kind of like it was church. Um, and right before we'd go to the library, and sometimes right after, we'd always go to Burger King. So I kind of don't know if it is that I love books or that at that time I love Burger King. Um, but in fact, I know that this little event kind of turned me into a reader. And every time my grandparents saw me, they brought uh, books with them. And my grandfather would sometimes give me books that weren't even terribly appropriate for my age level. He would give me like Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses when I was 12. Um, and, you know, I was kind of like, yeah, that's a great book, but uh, <laughs> maybe not appropriate for me. But I remember struggling through it because I thought, you know, my grandfather thinks I can handle this. I probably can handle this. So my point is that children don't necessarily become readers by accidents. Um, yeah, so I could talk to you about a bunch of other things today if you want, or we could kind of just take some questions, and I think that would be be great, too. <laughs> sure, sure, we have a first question from our CEO. He wants to know how did the book reveal itself to you to be written? Um, hmm, how did the book reveal itself to me to be written? I should know that by now. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't seem to know it by now. No, you know, it's funny. I pretty much the, I, I kind of mentioned, made reference to this, but kind of the great trauma of my 20s was, uh, was being published. 
<laughs> and so I think I tend to write about things that traumatize me in some way. And so as soon as my first book was published, I had this idea for a story about, um, about books, and I would call it my book about books. And I remember I wrote about 100 pages of it about 10 years ago. And at that time, the main character was kind of the Maya character. Um, and then I put the thing away. And I didn't think about it for a long time. And then 10 years later, I realized, you know, it would be a much better story if, like, the uh, bookseller, who was her father, was the main character. And if the girl, the young writer, uh, the one closer to me, took a back seat in the story. And so I think that was kind of how that uh, story, story came about. <laughs> Um, the book is filled with quotes and recommended books. What was your purpose for including those? And were you trying to lead read, trying to lead readers to other authors and good books? Yes, you know, I think uh, you know, and I often talk about this. You know, obviously, when we read the same book, and on the subject of book clubs, just to kind of go there for a second, you know, uh, when we, I really am for them. <laughs> And that's because when we read the same book, we are connected through that book, even if we are connected in no other way. And so I, I think it's interesting that we can have these sort of shared connections through our shared pop culture. For some people, that's television. For some people, that's books, whatever that is, you know. And so, so that's what I was hoping. I was hoping the effect would be um, that you would be sort of on the inside of you know, of knowing a person. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, the reverse of that is kind of, I do think that when you ask somebody what their favorite book is, uh, it's something AJ says, when you ask somebody what their favorite book is, it does tend to be a more revealing answer than asking them like just anything else, like where are you from? You know, people go to great lengths to kind of uh, construct their identity through their favorite books, whether they even tell the truth or not, you know. Um, and so I, I do think all of those things are interesting. And, and, and again, in a sort of related question, I don't necessarily, I'm, I was once asked, did I think that the person who hasn't read all the books that Fickery references is badly read? And I absolutely do not think that. Um, you know, I think that anybody's sort of reading life is gloriously random. You know, that wasn't the point to say like, you know, you are badly read if you haven't read the exact same, uh, you know, taken the exact same reading path as Fickery has. You know, so I hate when people take that point. However, I'm very excited when they want to go explore, you know, things they haven't read, like, you know, like short stories uh, or something like that. That's great. Was there a um, particular reason why AJ was of Indian descent? Yes. Um, <laughs> well, it's interesting. Some of it came from the fact that I wanted to write a mixed race character. I'm a mixed race person, and the world is increasingly filled with people that are not necessarily one thing or the other. Um, and I wanted, you know, his sort of racial identity and the fact that it kind of made, put him outside of things um, to kind of contribute to his isolation on Alice Island, which is largely filled with, <laughs> with white people, you know? And I also knew that I thought Maya was also going to be mixed race. And so in the balance of things, um, I thought it would be good if AJ was also mixed race. And then I had the name Fickery. I went to school with a kid who was, um, Indian who had the last name Fickery when I and he he actually had no particular meaning in my life I just kind of remembered his name over the years and I liked the name Fickery um, because you know in Arabic it means intellectual and I thought the sort of in English to me it sort of sounded like the word finicky which I liked too and so in a way it was all these sorts of things and I also knew that AJ was a guy you know, his actual name is Ajay, A-J-A-Y, but that to kind of get along in life, he has uh, made his name a little bit more white. He's become an AJ, which I know is something that a, a lot of people um, this, of his age definitely did to kind of fit in more, you know, before our, our world was more diverse or more sympathetic to to the diverse, you know. Although when I was in Italy, it was I went on went to Italy on book tour, and they pointed out to me. They asked me, um, "Why is AJ always so into white women?" <laughs> he has a really particular taste, which I had not noticed. But I suppose that would be because his mother is a white woman. I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, 
in the story, there's a author visit. And what was your motivation for the author visit? And how does the author imposter showing up looking like a red faced Santa and his vomiting scene fit? <laughs> Well, if I was actually there, uh, I would have worn my Santa suit. That's how I do all my author visits, just like dressed up like like Santa, basically. Um, no, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's actually funny. Th that was uh, that was inspired by the year my debut came out. Another debut came out that was a lot more interesting to people because it was written by um, a man who was in his 80s. I think the book's called Rules for Old Men Waiting. And uh, people were interested in this book you know, in a way, because he was so very old when he debuted, you know, which I think is great. But at the time, I was deeply resentful of that. I'm like, he's getting a profile in the Times, and I'm getting like nothing, <laughs> you know. So, uh, so I, I was kind of inspired by that, the fact that we are, that depending on how you position a story, like who has written the story changes how you read a story, you know. So that, to me, was what that episode was about in many ways, that, you know, this was a book that she couldn't sell as just you know as just her but then when she kind of made it by an older man you know it kind of and, and turned it into a memoir it totally changed how people read that story and i think that's always a very interesting thing and i've always been phenomenal actually and, and on a totally separate track i've always been really fascinated by author fraud stories of which there are quite a few you know i think of like jt Leroy or um the woman i can't i think or the person that pretended that they were a Hiroshima survivor and published a book of poetry. I can't remember. I can't remember her uh, her name. But I've always been very interested in these sorts of, or or, or even James Fry, because that had happened around like in the last ten years. You know, when you uh, and I, and I do think that some of the things that. Leonora says to defend herself, like for instance, that though it isn't factually true, it's emotionally true. You know, I, I think, you know, that some of that can be true, you know, though I've never published any nonfiction <laughs> that, I, that I've claimed to be, uh, you know, true when it wasn't. But, um, but yes, I do think that that emotional truth can be different than that. So that was sort of my motivation in that. And also, I guess I do have a fantasy of, um, Sometimes when you get bogged down in doing too many author events, you would not mind like sending someone else <laughs> in your place, you know, like Santa or the Easter Bunny or <laughs> just like just anybody else, you know, a tape recorder and <laughs> your talk, whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> what are your views on the future of independent bookstores and paper paper books? Um, yeah, I have a lot of views on that. I, I think the thing is, it's funny because a couple of years ago, it seemed as if, um, you know, and when I give a longer talk, I sometimes talk about this subject, but a couple of years ago, it seemed as if people had kind of forgotten what the purpose of a bookstore was, do you know? Like they kind of just thought of it, well, I can get books cheaper online or what have you. And what I've seen in the last couple of years is that people have come to recognize more that the purpose of a bookstore in a community is beyond just the fact that it sells books. You know, it really is about what it adds to that community, you know, and in the same way that a library can too. Um, and so I think because people have become aware of the fact that their town spaces are better when they have bookstores in them, I notice that there's more consciousness for people wanting to go and patronize them. Um, and as for electronic books, you know, I we're, you know, we're so young in our relationship to them. I personally have an e-reader and like the character of AJ in the story, my e-reader was given to me by my parents who both uh, worked at IBM and were always like on the front of wanting me to have everything technological. And I didn't particularly want an e-reader, but then when I got it, I kind of was like, oh, look how this is kind of nice. I can easily read on the treadmill or what have you, you know? <laughs> so it has that kind of purpose, but, um, but I think when you start looking at studies, and somebody did a study about this, that people, things that you read in E, you were more likely to forget. So there was like a Swedish study where they had people, I think, read a short story. And, you know, they had the people that read it on E versus reading it on paper. The people that read in E had a lot harder time retaining what they had read and also with kind of putting events in order and that kind of thing. So, uh, so I think like the jury's still out on sort of, you know, if you want to remember what you read, you still might be better off reading on paper, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And that's just one example of it. Like here in LA, they tried to switch out uh, 
textbooks for iPads, you know, and it's happening a lot of places, but it kind of ended up being a fiasco because iPads are much more breakable than textbooks. You know, they, and it was honestly, it just really was difficult to, uh, anyway. So my point is with, with reading in paper versus reading in E, I think that we have to kind of be cautious about, um, you know, being sure that it is, it actually is the same thing. Because sometimes things that look like the same thing turn out to not be the same thing. And I know we certainly don't want kids to be reading an E and then not remembering anything. <laughs> you, know, we, you know, so I feel like they're, the jury isn't completely out on it. But I certainly do read some things in E, although the things I want to keep, I still kind of collect more in paper. So, yes. And I also, you know, there's a bookless library not not far from where I live. And, you know, I'm not sure that is a library. <laughs> you know, like all the arguments about whether a bookless library is good because, you know, it serves the community, because it has computer stations and people just want to like, you know, you know, look up job postings and such and that's better. But, you know, I'm not sure that that's the sort of like Carnegie purpose of the library, you know, that it's not just strictly speaking a community space for job speakers. You know, I think the curation of books might have something to do with it too, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we just had a question entered in from one of our remote locations. Um, what's your advice for aspiring authors, new authors? Um, <laughs> how remote was this location? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my advice for aspiring writers is, uh, you know, honestly, I, I find that that thinking is as important a part of the process as just writing. Like sometimes there just seems to be a lot of emphasis on, you know, getting it down. You know, we have like NaNoWriMo, you know, where you spend 30 days and at the end of 30 days you have 60,000 words. And, you know, to me, like thinking is a key process too before you attempt to, to write anything. So I don't mind um, having periods where I'm not writing as much. And I think it's fine to take that time. And you also need to take time to uh, all the boring advice is actually true about writing. You know, you have to read a lot and you have to write a lot, you know, and those are pretty much the only sorts of things that are very important, except I would add think a lot. My most, my most important advice is maybe just to get a really good chair because, you know, for a long time I didn't have a good chair. And I think like my posture suffered, I think, you know. <laughs> But you spend a lot of time in that chair, so it's worth the investment of, of the good chair it's sitting properly, you know. <laughs> what, um, I don't want to take too much of your time because you hung with us through our little snafus, but um, what's your next writing project and where will it take you? <laughs> well, I don't know where it will take me yet, but, um, and you can take more of my time because I did have you till, anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but, my next writing project is, well, I, when I wrote Fickery, I had kind of thought of it as being part of a bigger project. I've always been interested in sort of the ways in which technology uh, changes our experience of what it is to be human. So in many ways, Fickery is about the arrival of that e-reader and what that e-reader does to uh, change that community and that town space. Um, so, you know, for a while, so in any case, I had conceived of that as the book about books. And then I had three other books I wanted to write. One was the book about book about movies. One was the book about uh, photography. And one was the book about music. Um, because we've had so many major technological changes in all of those medium. And I think there are stories about the things we gain from these technological changes and the things we lose. So I'm working on the book about movies right now. Um, and... <laughs> <laughs> and, and I hope to take myself through this, and, you know, because for me, I think the reason I write books is to uh, figure out uh, things I want to know. And so there are things, that's where I hope I'm taken. I'm, I hope I'm taken to a place of figuring out, because um, sometimes I feel like, again, we all spend so much time on, on our devices, and I'm certainly not somebody who's not on my devices, but somebody we spend so much time on our devices in front of screens that it's hard to get any space to think about anything. Um, and so I want to write books that, that slow things down a little bit and allow us some time to think about things, this world we live in, this experience of being human in 2015 and how it's different than being human any other year. So, so that's what I, where I'm hoping to go. <laughs> okay. Great. We've all made your 
title our community read here for the Charlotte Mecklenburg area and just wanted to know what your thoughts or feelings were about that and the community read concept. Um, well, I love community read concepts because as I was talking, I think they're incredibly important because I, as I was saying to you before, you know, and the reason I think book clubs are important, it, it's really the same thing, which is just that when we read the same book, we are connected through our reading of that book, even if we disliked that book, you know, that it, it just ends up forging connections in ways that are things that are so hard to do these days. It's hard to ever get anybody on literally the same page. <laughs> You know, and this actually does that. It actually connects everyone who participates in that is now connected through this shared reading of this particular book. So I think they're hugely important, um, whether it's my book or someone else's book. <laughs> I would prefer them when they're my book. <laughs> but I'm okay with somebody else's book too, you know. Um, and, and, and I think that's great. And, and I actually think there's a lot to be said from even uh, – Again, the spectacle of, not spectacle, but from sort of disliking a book together, you know, can actually connect people, you know, and I certainly hope you're not all sitting there really hating Thickery, but, you know, even that when we discuss to, to have this sort of common thing, this common space between us, you know, if you think about it, just as an example, like people that watch Fox News versus people that watch CNN, they have certain things that they already think before they get there, but, you know, we have to find places in the middle where we can talk about things um, that aren't necessarily one side or the other. You know, so I think any time, any place can create a space that allows us to, to actually discuss things. You know, it's such a wonderful and valuable service. So that's my feeling about community reads. We Great. need them desperately, desperately. We need dialogue, you know. Absolutely. It, it can't just be me saying, I am right and this is that and, you know, nobody else yeah, we need to hear opinions other than our own. We need to disagree together respectfully, you know. So can a book do that? I don't know. <laughs> but anything that gets a bunch of people together to talk about anything is, is good. <laughs> well, this was uh, one of our many events around the community read and around your title. And I um, really want to thank you for joining us and joining um, Charlotte Mecklenburg Library. Do you have anything else you wanted to share with us? Um, let me think. What could I share with you? Uh, well, I could I could just read maybe like short briefly one of my favorite parts of the book. I think that's what I'll do. That'll give us a little out. Um, this is from the end of the book, but I won't read any of the spoiler parts because uh, some of you may not have read it. I know that's part of going to a book club event is how to pretend like you've read a book that you haven't read. So, but maybe you'll decide to read it now, so I won't spoil anything. But yes, this is from the end of the book, and it's one of my favorite parts, and maybe one of the reasons I wrote the book. And again, not very long, because as we discussed, you definitely all know how to read. It is so simple, he thinks. Maya, he wants to say, I have figured it all out. The words you can't find, you borrow. We read to know we're not alone. We read because we are alone. We read and we are not alone. We are not alone. My life is in these books, he wants to tell her. Read these and know my heart. We are not quite novels. The analogy he is looking for is almost there. We are not quite short stories. In the end, we are collected works. He has read enough to know there are no collections where each story is perfect. Some hits, some misses. If you're lucky, you stand out. And in the end, people only really remember the standouts anyway, and they don't remember those for very long. And so that's my favorite part. And I'll say briefly something about that, which is that I've always really, as an author who's written uh, flops and misses <laughs> and also a few hits, I've always loved the idea of collected works, the idea that you could collect all of um, an author's work into one book and for one bargain price, the presence of the hits redeems those misses a little bit. Um, and so I like that as an author and I like that as a human being, the idea that, you know, we aren't, the best days or the worst days, but <laughs> some collection of all of them. Um, and so that's why it's my favorite bit. And, you know, thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> well, on behalf of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, I'd like to thank you very much. And um, we look forward to your next works and hopefully reconnecting in the future. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Take Bye. care.